Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Stop Depression Summit. I am one of your hosts for these few days. My name is Allison Steger. And I wanted to remind everyone for a few moments what it is we're here to talk about. We all recognize that we have an issue of global pain and personal pain that is happening. We recognize that depression is a problem in the world today. We are gathered here together to try to come at it with inviting all these wonderful experts to come in and talk to us about some of the ways that we might manage depression more effectively. We want to help people in both their personal lives and in their professional lives and their communities to ease both their own pain and the pain of those that they might know or be associated with. And today I am so delighted to talk with Dr. David Hanscom. He is a, an orthopedic complex spinal deformity surgeon who was based in Seattle, Washington for 32 years. He retired from his practice in 2019 to focus on teaching people how to break loose from the grip of chronic mental and physical pain with and without surgery. His insights arose out of escaping from his own 15 year ordeal of suffering with severe chronic pain. As he began to share his approaches with his patients, a predictable sequence of learning evolved. It is reflected in his most recent effort, the DOC or Direct Your Own Care Journey. Dr. Hans will be talking about depression as a physiological and not a psychological state. David, thank you very much for being with us here and welcome. Thank you, excited to be here. Yes, so uh, I guess my first question for you is, how do we differentiate between the physiological and the psychological when we're discussing depression? Well, they're completely different. Okay, mm. so I have a model called dynamic healing, and every living creature survives by processing their stresses or circumstances or environment. The research room is called allostatic load. Mm -hmm. So we know that stress creates a bodily response that either allows you to feel safe or perceives threat. So if your body perceives threat, then your body goes into fight or flight, or mm -hmm. what we call threat physiology. And when I say physiology is how the body functions, and so it's your blood pressure, heart rate, breathing, um, body temperature, et cetera. That's how your body functions as physiology. So every living creature survives by activating their resources to survive, which activates their body's resources. So if you're in fight or flight, you're consuming resources to survive. And so then you need to go to safety. We call it rest and digest to regenerate the fuel in the cells, mm -hmm. you know, empty waste products out of the body, et cetera. So you have um, the physiological state. So thoughts are sensory input that create a physiological state of threat. So it turns out that consciousness, your thoughts are processed in similar parts of the brain, mental pain, or process similar part of the brain is physical pain with the same response. The trouble is with physical pain, we have an automatic withdrawal response called nociceptive system. So if you touch a hot stove, we pull out your hand. With thoughts, we have a problem. So if you have unpleasant thoughts, we they're painful or unpleasant. They're perceived by the body as such, but we do not have an automatic withdrawal response. Mm. So what happens, we suppress them or repress them. Why wouldn't we? We don't like them. Right. We also found that repressed thoughts actually are worse. They actually fire up the nervous system even more. Mm. So if you experience the thoughts or suppress them or repress them, your physiology gets even higher and higher. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is, I think human consciousness is the essence of all chronic disease, mental and physical. Interesting. So as far as the psyche, so it's not psychological, it's a physiological issue. So when you're in fight or flight, humans have a word for this state called anxiety. So anxiety is a result of a threat. It's not the cause. So the reason why I'm an orthopedic surgeon, people go, well, what does he know? Well, guess what? I had a severe panic attack for, I, I had severe anxiety panic attacks for 15 solid years. Mm -hmm. I also had another 16 additional severe physical symptoms. But the bottom line is that your stresses translate to your nervous system, which translates to physiology, which translates into symptoms. So the symptoms are physiological, not psychological. So your thoughts are input, the psyche. Your emotions are what you feel. That's okay. your physiology. So what happens, depression, so it turns out that anxiety, depression, bipolar, OCD, schizophrenia, 
are all physiological inflammatory states. They're okay. all inflammatory. So I'm not saying the psyche can't cause the inflammation. So this inability for humans to escape their consciousness drives sustained fight or flight. And my personal goal this next year is these obsessive thought patterns, which I think drives all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So this inability to escape your thoughts is a huge problem. As I talk to people more carefully about their mental state and their physiology and their symptoms, the common theme over and over and over again are these disturbing thought patterns. Right. And so I had OCD, which is called an obsessive compulsive disorder. A lot of people sort of a TV joke. I don't like psychological diagnoses in general for lots of different reasons. But what happens with OCD, you're manifest by incredible barrage of intrusive thoughts every three to five minutes or more. So towards the end, I couldn't escape these things. I was actively suicidal. I think these obsessive thought patterns actually would drive people to suicide. I have 20 medical colleagues dead from suicide. Mm. And I do think that this, and I think medical, I'm sorry, high level professionals are particularly prone to this problem. And we can talk about that later. Yeah. So what I'm saying, we're talking about a depression summit is that you're sustained throughout physiology. It's inflammatory. And depression is just a series of symptoms driven by, I'm going to get rid of the word anxiety and just say threat physiology. So if you think about it, the first symptom is you wake up early in the morning, can't go back to sleep. Well, those are racing thoughts. Right. Well, with the racing thoughts, you're full of adrenaline and cortisol. How can you sleep? So then you have trouble concentrating, which is a combination of these racing thoughts and lack of sleep. <clears throat> then you lose your energy. But again, your body, if you drive a car down the freeway in second gear, it's going to break down. When your body's always in fight or flight, it's going to break down. You're fatigued. You're tired. Then you start losing your appetite. Well, guess what? When you're in fight or flight, the blood supply shifts from your gut to your muscles, et cetera. Mm. Then you can't think clearly. Well, guess what? When you're in fight or flight, the blood supply and metabolic activity in your brain goes from your neocortex or the thinking centers into your limbic system or the survival system. Yeah. So that's why I think this is actually a human survival issue in a way because people don't treat each other very well. Right. right? Okay, so when you're anxious or frustrated, your brain goes offline. Mm -hmm. So if you look at abuse situations, people often do things to other people. And I came from a very abusive background. Mm -hmm. So typical pattern is people do things that they shouldn't do or, or shouldn't say. Well, they're thinking brains offline. You right. actually cannot think clearly. Yeah. So that's why it's such a critical factor because we try to treat anxiety and depression psychologically but this comes from the unconscious brain. So mm -hmm. your unconscious brain processes about 40 million bits of information per second. It keeps you alive. It's a gift. The, the, again, the words we use in this fight or flight state is anxiety. When you can't control a situation, you crank it up and become hyperactivated or angry. Mm. Anxiety and anger are survival reactions that are gifts. That's why we're alive. Right. But the conscious brain only processes 40 bits of information per second. So this unconscious survival response is a million times stronger than your conscious brain, a million to one. Right. Yet the conscious brain with these thought patterns sets off this massive survival response. We also know the data is really deep in this, and this is where I get my personal mission. One of my personal missions is to get the correct diagnosis for anxiety, but in a physiological state, mm -hmm. and for medicine to get symptoms in general based on physiology, not structure. Okay. And you may have heard a term called medically unexplained symptoms. Have you heard of this? I haven't, but I, it makes sense to me to hear that. Yeah. It's called MUS. I have a couple of those myself, so. yeah. What's that? I said, I have a couple of those myself. So I, I understand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a disastrous diagnosis because I'm going, wait a second. So your body's chemistry is way off. Yeah. You're in a hyperactivated state. Every cell in your body is affected by this. Everything's wrong. Right. It's completely explained by your body's neurochemical state completely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when your body's in fight or flight, your brain itself becomes inflamed. Half the brain is the inflammatory system. In other words, in other words half your brain is neurons. The other half of your brain is glial cells. And these glial cells have inflammatory markers on them. Mm. So your brain's actually part of the immune system. So you're in fight or flight, your brain's actually sensitized and fired up. Yeah. The speed of your nerve conduction doubles. 
And so you start experiencing a pleasant sensation that you would never experience otherwise. Right. So then, for instance, you're in fight or flight, this blood supply shifts from your gut to, again, your muscles, from your bladder, internal organs. So you get irritable bowel, sp irritable bowel spastic bladder, et cetera. So I'll just list personally, I won't go into detail, but I went through this myself for 15 years. I developed 17 different physical and mental symptoms. Oh, wow. I'll just list a couple of them. I had migraine headaches, which again, the blood vessels of your brain are inflamed. Okay. I had ringing in my ears, tinnitus, because your nerve conductions increased in its all. I had stomach issue. I had back pain, neck pain. I had skin rashes popping up all over my body. My scalp would itch. My feet would burn. I had extreme anxiety. And again, depression. I had extreme major suicidal depression. Mm -hmm. Again, it's just that constellation of symptoms driven by an activated threat state. So I had a major suicidal depression. And then I developed the OCD, which again is an inflammatory state. So all those symptoms are gone. Mm. I don't have, I don't, OCD is gone, mm -hmm. which in the mental health world is considered untreatable. I've talked to mm. some major medical centers, psychiatric systems, mm. considered OCD an unsolvable problem. It's not true. Yeah. And we can talk about that a little bit of a separate issue. I think it's sort of the essence of the entire conversation are these intrusive thought patterns. Right. They're pretty, they're very universal and they're getting worse. I think our sensory overload of our society is unbelievable. Yeah. So I still think these obsessive thought patterns, which is, we call it OCD, and OCD is an extreme form of those, but I talk to person after person after person, especially people in their teens and 20s, they're just tortured by these crazy thought patterns. Yeah. So again, we're talking about solving depression. Right. So let's get rid of the word depression. Let's just say an activated threat system. So again, the depression is just a constellation of symptoms at, driven by activated threat physiology. So again, I'll ask a rhetorical question, which is not intended to be answered. So anxiety and anger are words that we use to describe fight or flight physiology. Right. We're going to get rid of the word anxiety and anger and just say activated threat physiology and hyperactivated threat physiology. It's a million times stronger than your conscious brain. Talk therapy cannot work. It's a complete mismatch. Right. You strive for self-esteem, which is a disaster because it really fires up the nervous system. And so this massive survival response is not subject to rational control. Okay. So how do, you, how do you lower anxiety? Oh, are you, are you asking? Okay. <laughs> I am, but I, I mean, sort of, uh, you won't get the right answer, but the bottom line is simply lower threat physiology. You go from well, yeah, yeah that's, that's, yeah. Right. So there's a bunch of ways to do it. People say, well, mindfulness meditation, which are correct answers, but the answer we're looking for is simply lower the threat physiology. So is, is this where you would use like say cognitive behavioral therapy or a treatment like that? Was, would that actually work in this circumstance? So everything, so it's a complicated process. None of it's, none of it's hard, but it's complex. Right, sure. So I have a model called dynamic healing. Just a term I used about how the body responds to the environment. So you have the input or your circumstances or stresses, we call it the allostatic load. Mm -hmm. You have the state of your nervous system could be either calm or hyperactive. Then you have your physiology or the output, either safety or threat. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is chronic mental physical disease is a result of sustained threat physiology. Yeah. And the answer comes in to minimize the threat physiology and maximizing safety. You can't get rid of threat physiology. It was, it's never going to be pleasant. It's powerful. It keeps us alive. Right. So you have to develop a working relationship with it. So what you can do is that with the threat physiology, there's ways of stimulating the vagus nerve, which is the 10th nerve coming from the midbrain called mm -hmm. the cranial nerve, which is the most powerful anti-inflammatory force in the body. So you can do it by humming, which stimulates mm -hmm. the um, seventh cranial nerve. You can rub your forehead, which stimulates the fifth cranial nerve, again, close to the vagus nerve. Certain pitches of music like lullaby actually stimulate the eighth cranial nerve. Okay. There's also vagal stimulators that work directly. Breath work is powerful. Mm. And so those are things you can do to directly lower threat physiology. So in a given moment where you're anxious and agitated, which again happens every day, this yeah. is a very dynamic process. You can take some breath work, or just drop your shoulders down, just relax a little bit, take a deep breath. And what you're doing is not psychological, you're changing your body's physiology by right. directly stimulating the vagus nerve. So that's the output. So again, there's an input nervous system and the output. 
So with the nervous system itself, if your nervous system is hyperactive or hypervigilant, it takes less stress to actually set off the fight or flight. Right. The ways you can increase the resiliency of the nervous system is you can diet is big, an anti-inflammatory diet, exercise, very anti-inflammatory, sleep is huge. I actually cannot see people heal without sleep. By the way, I just want to tell your audience really clearly that chronic mental pain and physical pain is flat out solvable. Mm -hmm. If I understand the physiology of disease in general, which again, all of us learn in medical school, I don't know how we get so far off track here. Yeah. But by understanding physiology, you can do it yourself. This is not hard to do. Right. So I have hundreds of patients that have broken out of this process. And so what we're talking about is actually self-directed, is doable, and the medical system is actually going the opposite direction, which I won't mm -hmm. rant about that too much today. <laughs> so anyway, sleep, diet, and exercise. In fact, lack of sleep has actually been shown to cause chronic back pain. Cause mm -hmm. it. Wow. So how many surgeons do you think are asking their patients about sleep before they do major surgeries, right? No, they're just going in there, yeah. Right, so when I'm actually treating patients myself and I'm not in practice anymore, the number one target is sleep. Right. Nothing really happens without sleep. So you have sleep, diet, and exercise, and then none of them work by themselves. Some people say, I went on an anti-inflammatory diet and I still hurt. Well, again, that's one contributing factor. But again, everything contributes 15 to 20%. It's always a combination for people. Sure. So then the other thing, as far as the nervous system, you've heard of trauma therapy. And it's a tricky one because talk therapy doesn't really work because you actually reinforce the nervous system and reinforce the stories about your life. But you can train your brain to feel safe. Okay. A bunch of meth There's a whole world of somatic psychotherapy coming out, which is very powerful. And again, not a, not a solution in isolation because other things work. But what happens if you just picture a feral cat, which has had to survive on its own from the beginning, you can't get close to it. It's obviously been trained to look for danger every second. So I came from an abusive background. So my nervous system is like a feral cat. So you have to learn how to feel safe. And so what a trained trauma therapist does, it helps you feel safe. So I actually went to 13 years of psychotherapy to try mm -hmm. to solve my chronic pain, mm -hmm. but I didn't realize from a neuroplasticity standpoint, I'm actually reinforcing the problem. Mm -hmm. So things get way worse with talk therapy. Nobody taught me how to just relax, feel my emotions, feel safe with them. So the essence of trauma therapy is learning how to feel safe. Mm -hmm. So again, with the nervous system, you have diet, exercise, sleep. Some people need trauma therapy, which is unfortunate because I think the trauma we do to each other is horrible. And we'll, I'll say this again, it's why I think getting anxiety correct <clears throat> is really the essence of human existence in a way, because, <clears throat> okay, you have a partner, you love this person, there's so much domestic violence, it's right about 30% for both males and females. Why would you do that? Mm -hmm. Why would you physically hurt your spouse or child? Because your brain is offline. Right. And my mother would do some terrible things. And then every time she's incredibly remorseful because when you're angry and triggered, your brain is offline. Right. Then all of a sudden it's, I think it's, I think it's temporary insanity. And now I physiologically know that. And I never could understand why she was so remorseful afterwards because once you get back to your thinking brain, you can't believe that you just did that. Mm -hmm. When you get triggered again, you have no control. Yeah. So you have this repetitive domestic abuse cycle. Right. So anyway, there's the output we just talked about the nervous system. Then the final part, there's lots of different things here, is the input. So we talk about cognitive behavioral therapy. <clears throat> what you're doing, you're changing thought patterns. So much of our conscious brain is from cognitive distortions, like should thinking, labeling, minimizing the positive, maximizing the negative, mind reading. There's lots of things we do that create these stories about our life. Right. The problem is they fire up the nervous system and they fire up your physiology. So the thing about cognitive distortions, which is a major factor in my healing, um, there's nothing to do. Hmm. If the distortions in the first place, they're, they're not real. Once you become aware of them and become aware of effect in your body, you can just let them go. Yeah. Again, that takes repetition. <clears throat> but the first step with that is a process called expressive writing. Have you heard of this process? No, I haven't. Okay, this is the number one starting point for the entire process. It's a book out called Opening Up or Writing It Down. 
written by Dr. James Pennybaker and Joshua Smythe. He published the first paper in 1986. He's been on my podcast a couple of times. Mm-hmm. And he found out that for some reason, we simply write down emotional feelings on a piece of paper. The sound almost starts de-energizing these thoughts. So you can't escape your thoughts, but you can separate from them. Yeah. So we've, he's a super nice guy. And he found this out by accident by dealing with women in chronic pain. He found out that most of them, as he started these writing exercises, is about sexual trauma, about mm-hmm. secrets. And so what happens, he said, everybody, everybody has secrets. So we asked him why it worked. He's, he didn't really know for sure. But his sense when he, he found this out by accident, when, when people did this deep emotional expression, all this stuff came out on paper. Yeah. You don't have to talk to psychiatrists about it. You don't have to confess it, whatever you need to do. Just getting on, just getting it on paper is a huge release. So that is the only one mandatory step of the entire process is expressive writing. Okay. Because you're changing the. Okay, Okay, I I do have a little bit of a follow-up question on that. So you've talked a little bit about how damaging just talk therapy is because you're just reinforcing the same story over and over again. How would you prevent yourself from just doing that again? by just telling the same story the same way you always have without creating that new way of looking at it or a new way of framing it. So all you're doing with the expressive writing, you're not solving anything. So what I have people do, and this is what actually what pulled me out of my 15 year tailspin was expressive writing. Okay. I didn't know the data. I did it by accident. I read David Byrne's book called Feeling Good, which is a great book. Mm. I thought it was the book, but actually it was the writing that probably broke me out of it. And what happens, the thoughts are in paper, you're here, yeah. separated by vision and feel, which are part of your unconscious brain. So I have people write down whatever they want to write and instantly tear it up. Mm-hmm. So you're tearing it up for two reasons. One of them is to write with absolute freedom. And you have to be careful because some people, as you start writing these thoughts down, you can actually decompensate a bit. Mm-hmm. So I say, look, start easily to start writing, but the deeper the emotional expression, the more powerful the process. But the bigger reason to tear these pieces of paper out because when you write, all these issues come up, yeah, right? Absolutely. They're issues. They are not issues. That's right. the key. They're just thoughts. Yeah. So that's the key is that with talk therapy, trying to analyze your past, trying to fix it, solve it, the reality is, is they're just thoughts. Right. And so what you're doing again with, with expressive writing, you're changing sensory input. So we'll talk about OCD in a second, because expressive writing is the one mandatory step that starts this whole thing. I have not seen any person heal without the expressive writing. Again, I'll just rant for a second. We just talked to Dr. Penny Baker about six weeks ago, and he just became very philosophical about this. There's over 2,200 research papers that says that this works. Wow. So viral loads decrease, wound healings improve, cardiac function improves. Even viral load and HIV drops down, PTSD improves. I mean, it's incredible school performance, athletic performance, mood, anxiety, a simple tool. 2,200 research papers on it and climbing. Guess how many research papers there are documenting the effectiveness of spine surgery? Right. Back pain, zero. <laughs> zero, of course, sure. And we're at $20 billion a year in the United States on back surgery for back pain. Well, maybe that's why it's 20, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's why I quit my practice because yeah. I kept, I was a complex spine surgeon. I was seeing person after person have a surgery for back pain. And again, I don't want to throw my colleagues under the bus because I wouldn't know this stuff. I mean, if I hadn't gone through this myself, I would have no work. Yeah. But I was in active spine surgery doing surgery for back pain. And the data came out in 1993 that the success rate for a back fusion for back pain in the state of Washington and workers' cup was 22%. Oh, wow. That's low. I just stopped. No, I'm not yeah. going to do this anymore. At the same time, I dove into this deep hole of chronic pain, 17 different symptoms, mental and physical. Mm-hmm. And so I just want to stop there just for a second and reinforce this idea that, as my one friend says, it's all the same suit. So again, anxiety, depression, OCD, bipolar, um, schizophrenia are all metabolic inflammatory disorders. But so is Alzheimer's. Parkinson's, cardiac disease, hypertension, adult onset diabetes, obesity, right. autoimmune disorders, cancer, osteoporosis, every one of them has the same inflammatory sequence cleared down to the cellular level, oh, wow. every one of them. So there's a common root for all chronic mental and physical diseases. 
And I just gave a lecture back in Florida at a big conference with another psychologist friend of mine. You actually cannot solve physical symptoms without dealing with the mental aspect of it. Right. Cannot do it. So it's not like one's mental, one's physical. It's all the same thing. But again, so, going back to... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Going back to our original idea, which I really want to hammer home today, is that I think these intrusive thoughts, obsessive thought patterns, are the driving force behind essentially all chronic disease. Because mm -hmm. you can't escape them. And that's why expressive writing is so critical. So that's where Dr. Pennybaker has pointed out that he doesn't know exactly why it works, but they've also found no alternatives. Okay. In other words, there are things you can do in addition to this. I mean, trauma therapy to help you feel safe helps, et cetera, diet, exercise, but you can't do it without this. You just cannot heal without the expressive writing. You can get better and do I mean, other things help, mindfulness meditation, et cetera. So let's go to mindfulness for a second. Mm -hmm. You're switching sensory input. So I call it active meditation. So just sit there, you know, drop your shoulders for a second, feel the chair. So maybe you're going on racing thoughts, maybe your brain's going 100 miles an hour. But what you're doing, you're just simply switching sensory input. So with mindfulness meditation, you're actually switching sensory input, less fight or flight. The two other things I mentioned briefly on input is one is what are you putting into your brain and what are you holding on to? Mm -hmm. Most people that are in, well, first of all, forgiveness is a big one. Mm. So anything you're hold on, holding on to from the past fires up your nervous system. But so why do you want somebody that you really dislike in your life today? You don't like this person. You don't like this situation. You don't have to. And I think forgiveness, by the way, is too big of a word. We can talk about that later. I call it anger processing. Mm -hmm. But you got to let it go. Right. Otherwise, you can't heal if you're holding on to anger. So the final thing I'll say is that one of the cardinal rules of healing, almost as important as expressive writing, we don't let people discuss their pain, their medical okay. care, come off the internet searching for solutions, no complaining, gossiping, criticism, or giving unasked for advice. Right. Because you're just... So that's bringing the pain, keeping it in a constant state of churn inside of yourself. Yeah. Right. And what you might have noticed <clears throat> that I found out that, um, again, when I say chronic pain, I mean, now I say chronic disease, but most people that are suffering from a chronic illness complain a lot to everybody. Probably see. Yeah, that's true. Right. And when I ask people to stop discussing their pain, they don't know what to do. They go, well, what do yeah. I talk about? I, I can go into a lot of detail on that one particular topic, but. People complain a lot. All of us do. Yeah. It took years to stop this. But when I ask people to simply stop, it takes at least two weeks to slow the train down, at least. Sometimes it takes longer. And we used to hold workshops back in New York. And that was one of the cardinal rules of the workshop about don't discuss your pain, complain, et cetera. Mm -hmm. People would sneak up behind the buildings to complain about their pain. Like I mean, it's like addiction. smoking cigarettes in high school, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, but I mean, honestly, it becomes a habit pattern. You don't know what to do. It just comes so deeply ingrained in your psyche. And my thing is, well, what do you want? It's easy to complain, but what do you actually want? Right. What do you want in this place? Yeah. Right. So I'm going to, I'd like to summarize what I'm saying. And one thing, we'll go back and discuss a couple things that mm -hmm. you'd like to discuss, but there's two parts to healing. <clears throat> one of them is you learn to regulate your physiology, which is number one. Yeah. You're in fight or flight or safety. Again, the input, the nervous system, and the output. There's techniques that you use every day, all day long. becomes automatic with time. So you develop a working relationship with your stress physiology. You're not mm -hmm. going to get rid of it. You're not going to make anxiety a better feeling because it's not supposed to be. It will never be. But it's a gift. You learn to develop a working relationship with your anxiety. So in other words, you learn to process adversity more quickly. Right. Okay, so you're in this time in fight or flight. But the real healing occurs is about nurturing joy. Mm -hmm. So it's good food, good wine, good friends, spiritual perspective, giving back, a bunch of things you can do to nurture joy. But if you're fighting off anxiety and anger, which again is a million to one ratio, how do you nurture joy? Right. So they're two separate skill sets. Right. You learn how to process the adversity, you learn how to nurture joy. And I don't know about you, but I never was really taught to nurture joy. I mean, where in my life was I taught to nurture joy? not really taught to us. So it's still a challenge for me being this obsessive spine surgeon to actually relax and just, you know, try yeah. my life. I'm always on the to-do list thing. So <laughs> anyway, so I call it 
the, I call it becoming a professional at living your life. So you, instead of going back and trying to analyze and fix your past, you're simply learning tools to process adversity and systemic, systematically nurturing joy. That's where the healing occurs. So if you're, you're always trying to fix the pain or problems or whatever, you're actually from a neuroplasticity standpoint, that's where your brain is going to develop. Mm -hmm. So I have a little saying to have a good life, you actually have to live a good life. You have to right. practice. So it sounds complicated, but it's not. Um, what I put together is called the DOC journey. Right. It's very self-directed. It is better with coaching, which I actually do some coaching. But it goes through the sequence that allows you to, first of all, engage with your disbelief, because that's where it all starts, by the way. I mean, why is this going to work? Mm -hmm. It's not about generating belief in David Hanscom or the Dr. Journey or something else or anybody. It's about connecting to your own capacity to heal. So that actually starts with connecting to your disbelief, not belief. And then you just do tools to keep re reprogramming your brain. So anyway, we covered a lot of ground. I'm happy now to go back and answer some questions. Um, but it's, it's a different paradigm. And I do think, I'm not sure if this is part of your bandwidth, but these obsessive thought patterns are a completely different, massive topic that I'm mm -hmm. reasons why they occur, why we can't escape them, why psychology is not solving it these days. Right. And to me, the driving force behind depression are these obsessive thought patterns. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So you, uh, yes, you have, you've covered a lot of ground. There's a lot of incredible information here. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. I, I mostly around, you know, it's, it's an overwhelming amount of information and it's, it's really just about how do we set people on a path toward this kind of healing? Like, right. you know, you know, feeling depressed or dealing with any kind of these major physical and psychological issues you are. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just such an enormous lift, but we need to give people like very small little first steps that they can take that are going to put them on the path to healing themselves. So right. you, know, you talked about reducing inflammation, you know, with better sleep, better nutrition, uh, you know, exercise, all of these things. So it feels like those are the two things that are going to go together. Like you're going to take care of your psych psychological self and your physiological self. And both of those things are going to lead to a better outcome and like spiral upward in, in a better way. Does that capture it? Or can you well, maybe articulate that a little bit better? Yeah, I probably gave you more than you needed. To. Um, so here's <laughs> the so, so the dog journey, it, it takes all of this and puts it in a sequence. So you can't do it all but at once. Some people say I tried exercise, didn't work. I'm sleeping, not working. So the dog journey takes you through a sequence that's, that we've seen hundreds and hundreds of patients break out of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. So my message is, is that chronic illness symptoms are solvable including anxiety, depression, OCD. They're solvable problems. So what the doctor does, it takes you through a sequence of, do, of just doing some basic skills to start calming down your nervous system. Then it gives you an, a pain education as well as education about um, how you solve it. Then the third section is about the physiological nature of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And the fourth section, which is right in the middle of it, is awareness. Okay. You become aware of what's going on before you can change it. You're also trying to stimulate neuroplastic changes in your brain. So you have to know what is before you can change direction. Then the fifth one is where the rubber hits the road is the fifth section on anger. Mm. And, and everybody that heals crosses the anger threshold, which is also a learned skill that's used every day. And then the sixth section is like any athlete learning, learning a skill. There's a book called The Talent Code about athletes and artists learning their skills. Mm -hmm. It's focused repetition. Mm. reprogram your brain and take repetition so it's taking these tools and actually using them every day yeah and it's not as hard as it sounds because they become automatic right. then the last section is creating the life that you want i use a metaphor of building a house and each mm. room represents a part of your life that you're going to rebuild and so as opposed to trying to so i always recommend that people take the course they do it 15 minutes a day at the most mm -hmm. and to really just practice 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 and then we also have an app that's a little bit more experiential. It's not quite as in depth, but in some ways it's quicker because it goes through awareness, hope, forgiveness, and play. Mm -hmm. My wife put it together. She's a tap dancer. Mm -hmm. It's based on our workshops that the antithesis of pain is play. Yeah. Play is a physiological state. Right. So rhythm, art, music, horse therapy, cat therapy, all these different things actually calm your nervous system. But again, mainstream medicine, there's lots of data on this, by the way. It's all right there, but we don't bring this in the medical world because we're using medications, et cetera. So, but you can't go from pain to play without the sequence. Right. 
So you have to process your anxiety and anger, which is again, the learned skill. Yeah. You can learn to nurture joy, which again, is again, plays a physiological state of safety. And there's a lot of ways of achieving that. So that's where I wrote a book called Back in Control, a surgeon's mm-hmm. roadmap out of chronic pain, which reflects my story. Right. The doc journey course and app reflect the physiology, which I did not know back then when I wrote the book. Uh-huh. So it's an evolving process. And the number one factor that predicts success if people simply engage. So again, I had 17 different symptoms that are gone. Mm. My anxiety is gone, depression is gone. Even these intrusive thought patterns are gone. OCD is considered unsolvable in the psychiatric world. But again, you have to deal with the physiology because if you don't calm down the nervous system, your thoughts keep coming out like, right. you know, like clay pigeons at a shooting range. So yeah, it's, that's why the sequence is so critical. And that's why it's so different because we're all used to fixing. This is a process of letting go and moving forward. Yeah. And one of the biggest factors in my personal healing was I just gave up. So I can't do this anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I did for endless cures. I, was a, I call myself an epiphany addict. And the answers aren't there. The answer is allowing your own body to heal. Right. So what I'm saying is not some form that I made up is simply based on deep neuroscience data. Mm-hmm. Somehow medicine has overlooked this data. And again, we've watched hundreds and hundreds of patients come completely out of the medical system, completely out of the medical system. I have one girl who was 29 when she came to our workshop. She had severe neck pain for four years, was in high dose narcotics. Mm-hmm. She has seen 10 doctors, has six injections into her neck. Within one week, she went to pain free. Incredible. And 10 years later, she has two beautiful kids. She's mm-hmm. out of pain. She just is thriving at a level that's fantastic. And the exciting part for me is once you quit fighting anxiety and anger, then your conscious brain can go wherever you want. And so people really do thrive at a level that they never knew was possible. Yeah. Another guy, 28 surgeries in 20 years. He's been out of pain for 20, he's been out of pain for six years now. He's exercising every day. He has no pain. Mm. He says he's never felt better in his entire life, even after 28 surgeries. Wow, that's an incredible uh, testament to the work that you're doing. Oh, so I, I did have one thing that I was curious about that I wanted to ask you. So you talked uh, at one point about expressive writing and how critical that is as part of this process. Right. And and you, and you also talked about you know the vagus nerve and how you can how you can change you know with uh, uh, activating things in the throat, doing breath work, things of that nature. And I'm actually wondering if part of what is working with the expressive writing is, you know, writing is, if you have a pen and a paper, you know, that's a physical act. You're actually moving your body in a certain way. It's not just thoughts that are only occurring here. You're actually moving your body in a way that's moving energy or, you know, ideas or whatever physically through the pen, right? So I'm actually wondering if that physiological aspect to the writing is actually part of what makes it effective. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I sort of break it up into, you know, input nervous system and the output, but obviously they all overlap tremendously. Right. The the change in sensory input, but you're also directly stimulating the vagus nerve. So I just make the differentiation just for thinking processes. Mm -hmm. But what does make a difference, what I think has made the biggest difference the last couple of years for me is when you put all these, if you put all these symptoms in terms of physiology, they're not medically unexplained symptoms, they're medically explained symptoms. Mm-hmm. Once you understand you put these terms into physiology, um, it just makes sense. Yeah. And then the doc journey process is not a self-help process, it's a foundation of knowledge, and people figure out how to help themselves. Mm-hmm. So people say, well, it's like a miracle. Well, again, as, like I said before, life is a miracle. The body is incredibly complicated. And as you allow your body to heal, your body can heal. Yeah. Will heal. It'll heal, it'll heal emotionally and it'll heal physically or physiologically, both. Right. But again, stress translates into threat physiology, translates into symptoms. Right. So that's not pain in your head, that's pain in your body. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. You can't fly a Boeing jet without a computer. <laughs> the Boeing jet only has 2 million parts, your body has 30 trillion cells. So your body's not going to run without a nervous system. Right. And so I don't use a, I don't use the word mind body anymore. I just use the word unit response because it's just a unit. The term mm-hmm. mind body implies is a separation. There's not. There's zero separation between your nervous system and your body. They're completely intertwined. 
30 trillion cells. They have mm-hmm. to, to communicate with each other. So our body knows how to survive. Yeah. So um, anyway, it's my wish is to get going back to the original conversation. My personal mission is to get anxiety on the right, correct diagnosis based on deep, deep, deep data that is a sensation generated by threat physiology. We'll do anything to avoid that sensation because we're supposed to. Right. So it drives all sorts of human behavior that's pretty untoward because your brain's offline. And if we keep trying to treat, treat this massive survival response with psychological means or conscious means, it's not going to work. So there's a bunch of ways of calming down your threat physiology. Your brain comes back online. People thrive at a level they didn't know was possible. Mm-hmm. And it's just been really, it's like I quit my surgical practice to do this because I, see, I was seeing so many people badly damaged by spine surgery and so many people healing with no risk, minimal resources that, that I stopped my practice. Mm-hmm. So I, that's what I'm trying to do is make some dent in the way medicine perceives pain. And there is more and more people thinking the same way. I belong to an international work group that puts these things together twice a month, you know, digging into the data, trying to figure this out. So, I mean, I'm excited about it. I am sort of discouraged how little penetration is getting into the medical world. Mm -hmm. But my goal is to bring this stuff into mainstream medicine. Well, thank you so much for all of this incredible information. There's so much to unpack here. And and I hope that all of us that are listening will have the opportunity to listen to you uh, again and and follow up on your work. Can you uh, tell us a little bit more about the best way to dive deeper into this with you? Is there books, websites? I mean, I mean, you've talked about a couple of books that you recommend, but if people wanted to go deeper with this work, what would be the best way for them to do that? So do do you have show notes? Show notes. I mean, I do have play. I have a, a link to my resources page, which covers everything that I do. Okay. So there's the app, the course, I have two books, okay. I have coaching, I have <clears throat> psychology today, I have over 100 blogs with over one. Oh, okay, yeah, members. so so if we just just start maybe by Googling your name, and then we can go a little bit deeper into you, you have a YouTube channel, I understand, and, yeah. and books and things. So uh, that'll be a way. And also, you mentioned that you have availability as a coach as well, if people wanted to pursue that, sounds like. Yeah, part of the part of the doctrine course or the app is that I twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays at noon, I do one hour of, of didactic coaching, sharing, etc. Okay. So and then I put it at noon because a lot of there's a lot of Europeans on the channel yeah. and some Australians. Mm-hmm. And so I picked the time zone that a lot of people around the world yeah. could actually engage in. Um, so yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. This has been incredible. I learned so much myself and I can't wait to go and check out all of those things that you just mentioned and learn more about how to manage my own stuff. And so I guess I would say thank you so much, Dr. David Hanscom, for joining us here at the Stop Depression Summit. And also have people feel free to contact me. I do in in talk to endless people about this stuff because it is a huge paradigm shift. Yeah, absolutely. Fixing to letting go and it's hard to let go. So I'm excited about it. Excited about the successes, and I'm excited to be on your program and share the concepts. Well, we're thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing what you've learned with the rest of us. Thanks.